I'd like to uh, welcome to everybody to the May 2021 ARC weekly or monthly meeting. I'm sorry. Uh, Rob's put together another great program for us tonight, and we're going to give him a minute or two to set up. So in the meantime, we're going to let uh, uh, Stephen Slider give us a little update on the repeaters. So go ahead, uh, Stephen. All right, so um, as most of y'all are probably aware, uh, a couple weeks ago, we put in service one of the Vertex repeaters and uh, that has been modified to use with our controller. And so far it's been going pretty well. Um, there have been a few issues with it. Number one is that we, as some of you may know, there was no Southeastern Link repeater net um la or uh, yeah last night because there was an internal timeout timer in the vertex that has to be turned off so i thought i had it disabled but apparently i didn't and unfortunately that's going to require a trip up to the bank tower to fix so i may see if i can do that this weekend also there seems to be some noise issue still. I'm not really sure where it's coming from, but I'm keeping an eye on it. And uh, I think the goal now is to get the club's vertex repeater back on the air, having been modified. And uh, that should hopefully be in place for a while. And that's really it. All right, and uh, we're uh, like Stephen was saying, we're doing some work, so we're gonna you're gonna continue to kind of um, experience a few things here and there as we try to get it dialed in. So please be patient with us, and we're still also uh, trying to uh, get the uh, D Star uh, in better shape than it is at the moment, also. So that's gonna require a trip up to uh, Stowe Mountain. So. We're going to hope to have some resolution to that here soon also. So just be patient with us and uh, continue to join us on uh, Sunday nights, particularly with the uh, Sunday night net. And um, I'd like to, uh, are we ready to go, Rob? Or do you think we need a couple more minutes? I'll wait for, okay. Marcelo, I mean, I, I, you, let's see, Marcelo, you on yet? I am here. Hello. Oh, yes, on there. I'll, uh, I, well, if you think we're ready, I'll go ahead and pass it over to you, Rob. All right. Good afternoon, Marcel. He's on the West Coast. So he's enjoying, I guess, the afternoon. Lovely yeah, afternoon me... sunshine. Yep. <laughs> yeah. The uh, it's not dark here yet, but it's it's heading there. Um, yeah, let me let me just Marcel sent a, a bio that I put in the um, in the notes I sent out, but let me repeat that for the people who haven't heard that because he's uh <laughs> he's done a lot of different things. So we're, we are definitely lucky to have him tonight. So um, yeah, Marcel Steiber, AI6MS, has been an amateur radio operator since 2008. I'm sitting outside, if I heard the car, while attending the Cal Poly State University in St. Louis Obispo. He was president of the Cal Poly Amateur Radio Club, W6BHZ, and is currently the industry advisor to the club. He graduated with a master's degree in double E concentrating on RF and communications and writing his thesis on radio direction finding network receiver design for low cost public service applications. And, uh, and I would imagine fox hunts. Um, Marcel currently serves as chair of the Carroll Poly Electrical Engineering Industry Advisory Board. He is an assistant emergency coordinator for the city of Cupertino, serving as the trustee and technical lead for the Cupertino Aries UHF repeater. So he's, he's, re, he's a, a repeater guy, W6 TDM, and is the project lead for the Cupertino Aries ARCnet project, which is building up a high speed wireless intranet for the emergency responders in Cupertino. That, that'd be nice to hear about sometime. Marcel regularly volunteers at local repeater work days as an RF technician and tower climber. Hear that, John? although he's, he's far away, and enjoys providing communications for local bike rides and triathlons. He also volunteers as a technical advisor 
to several event management companies and local repeater groups. Uh, airplane, sorry. He's an AWRL life member and has helped license over 1,500 hams since 2009. And counting. Uh, mostly recently working to develop processes and train teams using fully remote examination methods. That's, that's cool. And there's more info on him at his QRZ, on his QRZ page, and that is uh, AI6MS. That's, <laughs> that's quite a uh, quite a list of accomplishments there, Marcel. So having said that, um, I'm going to turn over the program to, uh, to you. We have a lot of I'm curious people about batteries. That sounds great, Rob. Thanks very much for the intro. Um, if you can turn on screen sharing for me, that'd be great. And I can go ahead and share that. Um, yeah, no, thanks for the intro and uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, and yes, I climb towers and I know Atlanta is a little bit far away from California, but if I'm ever out there and you guys need a tower climber, I'm happy to <laughs> help join and help, and help out. So that's uh, always fun. All righty. Um, uh, screen share working. Yeah. Can you guys see that? Okay. Looks good. Okay. Perfect. Um, this actually... is the Zoom password. LMB. Let me change my the other screen share so I can still see you guys. Okay. There we go. Alrighty, welcome. So today we're going to talk about lithium batteries, and uh, hopefully that works out. If the host can help mute people that are chatting, that would be helpful, um, just so we can get moving. It looks like we're recording today. Um, my presentations are also available on YouTube and everything, so uh, and on my QRZ, so you can always grab them from there. Uh, my recommendation during the meeting is to keep microphones muted. If you want to keep your cameras on, um, I have you on. Ah, there we go. Thanks. I just got muted. Um, so yeah, if uh, people want to uh, keep their cameras on uh, during the meeting, that's always nice. And I can see people's faces and see if people are falling asleep. Um, if I need to speed up, slow down, um, change uh, or answer any questions or raise hands. Um, do ask questions in the chat. Um, I can watch the chat as we're going through. And uh, I have a couple of pauses in the presentation to kind of uh, address any questions for each section. Um, and we'll go from there. Uh, I'd like to start off before I give my intro. Um, of kind of who uh, has some battery experience. So um, how many people own a battery of some form in their house? Everyone's hands should be going up, All right? How many people have built their own battery or battery pack or battery backup system? A handful, okay. Um, how many people are intricately familiar with lithium batteries and all the internals? And no more than me. Okay, cool. Got to keep an eye on those folks. Um, it's always dangerous. Uh, so uh, hopefully that'll be fun. Uh, I think Rob gave a nice intro, but a uh, short version. So my name is Marcel, AI6MS. Um, I was licensed in 2008 while I was a student at Cal Poly um, here in California. Uh, and yeah, I think you got most of the background. Uh, the last bullet there is in my day job, I work on battery and charging systems for consumer electronics products. Um, so I've been uh, working over eight years now in that kind of field. So I've been playing with batteries for a long time um, and shipped a lot of batteries, millions of batteries in various products. So uh, hopefully it's relatively relevant there. Oops. All right, so today's presentation, we're going to fo focus on uh, a little bit of battery history, uh, three main battery types. So lead acid, which is kind of what most people are familiar with from kind of historical usage. Um, we'll talk about lithium ion battery chemistry in general, and we'll talk about the specific lithium iron phosphate chemistry, uh, pros and cons of each chemistry, kind of how you'd use them, how you'd misuse them, um, and everyday application tips for 12 volt amateur radio. So this is really kind of the focus of today's talk. Um, with really this amateur radio focus, um, but hopefully a lot of background and info. Um, this is my extended talk. So Rob asked me to go for the, um, the hour. So I've got a, a, this is the longer version, but if stuff is too not interesting enough or if we want to skip through stuff, um, do let me know and we can always skip a couple slides. Um, and do ask questions. It's a bi-directional cue. So um, it's always helpful for live presentations that you can actually interact with the speaker and, and ask more questions. Um, so hopefully that works out. Um, so yeah, let's jump right in. Uh, I like to start off with batteries. So batteries fundamentally are an electrochemical energy storage device, right? So just like um, uh, gasoline is for a car is a, a chemical storage, right? Um, but that's for combustion, right? Electrochemical storage is what we do for batteries. And generally we use layered construction um, where we have layers stacked on top of each other of an anode and a cathode. So the negative and positive terminals with an electrolyte between the two. 
um, and that electrolyte is some sort of allows the ions to flow between the two sides. Uh, the original battery was back from the 1800s um, from Alessandro Volta. Yes, that's where the Volt came from. Um, and uh, he designed this zinc and copper battery uh, with brine soaked paper. That was the electrolyte in the middle. So here on the right, you can see this is what that battery is a mock-up of that battery, what it looked like. You can see the copper plates and the zinc plates. And then they had this like salt water soaked paper in between it um, that allowed the electrons to flow. Um, it's also worth pointing out that uh, the schematic symbol right, for uh, a battery has these same anode and cathode plates in it. right? And technically, based on the number of anodes and cathodes, the number of cells you have in your battery, you'd add more lines to that schematic symbol. Um, again, with the positive um, cathode on the top and the negative anode on the bottom, very similar to those plates in that battery. So I think that history is kind of useful. It's, it's always neat to see how these things all relate together. Okay, so we talked about this briefly, but one of the fundamental concepts for a battery is what's known as a nominal cell voltage. And this is really comes down to the chemistry of the ions and the chemistry that you're using in that battery. Um, and different chemistries have different nominal cell voltages. So your standard alkaline battery that we talk about is what's known as a carbon zinc battery. Um, and those are 1.5 volts nominal cell voltage. So if you think about your AA, your AAAs, your C batteries, your D batteries, those are all 1.5 volt nominal. Um, the NICAD, or um, also NIM batteries are just kind of similar. Um, that was in the 1.2 volt, right? So they were kind of sold as a replacement. You could use them for alkaline batteries, but they're slightly lower voltage. So some devices like your HT, if you put in NIM batteries or NICAD batteries instead of the alkaline batteries it was expecting, it'll yell at you and think it's low voltage because it's just doing some voltage checks and a 1.2 volt alkaline battery would be low voltage. Um, lead acid is the last example I give here. Uh, is a 2.1 volt nominal voltage. And you go, wait a minute, Marcel, lead acid batteries are like 12 volts, aren't they? And I'm like, well, yes, but the individual cell voltage is 2.1. And we'll get into that detail. That's a really key thing to understand there is how that nominal cell voltage transfers to then a pack voltage. So in order to get to that full battery voltage, to get to that 12 volt battery, you have to stack these individual cells together, right? And what we're going to be targeting during this presentation is this what we call 12 volt DC amateur radio, which is really a 13.8 volt plus or minus 15%. So if you look at the data sheets for most mobile radios and HF radios, they all specify their input voltage as 13.8 volts plus or minus 15%, which is roughly 11.7 to 15.9. So that's really what we're talking about today. How do we design a battery that gives us the most power in that range, right? Um, and if we ever go outside of that range, then you're either over voltaging your mobile radio and you're gonna damage the input, or you're under voltaging the radio and it's going to brown out or have harmonics or behave erratically and it's not designed for that. Um, so the picture here on the bottom right, um, this is the inside of a nine volt battery. So if you've never taken apart a nine volt battery, I strongly recommend in a safe environment to do so um, on a non fully charged one and take it apart. Uh, typically, so there are two styles. One is like this where you'll see uh, there are plates in here and these are your carbon zinc plates, right? Just as you expect, there's your carbon and there's your zinc. Um, how many cells are in this? Anyone? Show fingers, hands. How many cells are in this battery? Seven. Seven, six, seven, six. Six is the answer. So one and a half volts times six individual cells gives you nine volts. Ta-da! The math works, right? So nine volt batteries are literally six 1.5 volt carbon zinc cells in series. Um, the other construction type, if you do take apart a nine volt battery at home sometime, is that they actually have quadruple A's in there. So you'll see six individual kind of cylindrical cells um, sitting in there um, that uh, make up that battery. So it's kind of cool um, how that works. OK, that's kind of the intro. Uh, next stage is lead acid. So this is kind of the first history piece, just to give some context for why we use them everywhere. So lead acid batteries have been around since about 1859. Um, that's when Wikipedia says they first existed. Uh, the, so the original battery was 1800, so about 60 years later, they came out with lead acid construction. Um, typically, for a 12 volt battery, you have these six plates, again, six nominal cells of 2.1 volts um, gives you this 12 volt battery. Um, and the chemistry here is you know, pure lead on, on one side and lead oxide on the other with sulfuric acid as the electrolyte, which is why you know, when you talk about these batteries, people are always like, oh, they've got acid in them. It's called a lead acid battery. That's where the acid portion is, that electrolyte that allows the ions to move between. Um, this picture here on the left, this is a cross section of a motorcycle battery or car battery, kind of same construction. And again, you can see there are six chambers in here, 
right? And between those chambers, you're shorting between the cells to give you uh, them stacked in series. So here on the right, you can see the picture again. There's your positive electrode, and then you have this negative electrode that's connected, um, connecting, and then it's connecting to the next one. So it's connecting six cells in series. Um, when you add all those together, you know, six cells in series gives you a nominal voltage around 12.6 volts um, and uh, a range of about 10.8 to 14.2, right? Uh, and this is where the first problem lies. So lead acid batteries with a nominal voltage of 12.6, that's already below our 13.8 target, right? So uh, one of these, this, this chart here is what's a discharge chart or a graph that shows you at different discharge rates, what is the battery voltage output? Um, so for a lead acid battery, um, if it starts up here at like 12.6 under no load with a very light current draw, you can pull like 10 hours from it and it'll um, tank here towards the end. If you pull higher charge rate out of it, then it'll tank here earlier. Um, it uses a terminology here called C rate. You'll see it's like 3C, 2C, 1C. So if we use this and say, hey, for a 10 amp hour battery, for example, we'll take a 10 amp hour battery, a 10 amp hour battery at 1C means you're discharging it at the rated, at the maximum capacity. So at, at a 10 amp hour battery, you're discharging at 10 amps is a 1C discharge. Um, and the interesting thing here I'd like to point out is if you take a 10 amp hour lead acid battery and you discharge it at 10 amps, you're gonna hit this curve where it tanks after about 25 minutes or so at 10 amps. That's not 10 amp hours of charge, Marcel, right? That's less than half that, right? So lead acid batteries are typically only rated at the 0.1 or 0.2C discharge rate. Right, so if you have a 10 amp hour lead acid battery, it's really only expecting to be discharged at one amp continuous. So one amp continuous, if that's our 0.1 C discharge rate, you'll see it almost makes it to 10 hours. It makes it about to nine hours on this graph, right? So that's, you're pulling nine amp hours out of that lead acid battery. And that's a key thing to think about too. Lead acid batteries, depending on how quickly you're pulling charge for them, you get much, 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 much less capacity than they're actually rated for. Um, the second thing here is voltage, right? We said this 13.8 volts plus or minus 15%, that's the target that we're going for. Well, that lower limit, if we roughly draw that line here, 11.7 .7 on this graph, you'll notice that we hit that pretty soon. That 25 minute discharge is actually only like 15 minutes of discharge because you volt brown out, right? And if you add the series resistance of an extension cable of an extra power pole connector in there, any of those things that add to that voltage drop, you're now pushing this line even higher and you can see how quickly your radio will start to brown out. So I've seen this pretty frequently. If people take especially older lead acid batteries with a higher internal resistance, they bring them to field day, they fully charge them last night. Hey, I charged this up last night. They plug it into their radio. They've got their 10 foot cable plugged into their HF rig and they start transmitting 100 watts. The thing just browns out right away. It can't transmit, it just resets itself and, and, and starts over. Um, so that's that's, pretty typical. So oftentimes people buy the voltage boosters like MFJ and others make these voltage boosters, which try to keep that voltage closer to 13.8 so that you're not um, browning out the radio. Okay, just briefly kind of lead acid types, there's a sealed category and then a flooded category. Within the sealed lead acid or SLA category, there are several different types, absorbed glass mat, gel cell, deep cycle variants. These are all just tweaks of the overall chemistry. So they're still lead acid fundamentally, They've got the pure lead on one side and the lead oxide on the other side, um, but they kind of change the construction to take advantage of certain things. So the deep cycle variants um, don't get damaged as much if you discharge them to 0%. So you can use those um, you know, off-grid. They're starter batteries like in your car. Those are often AGM. Those are more useful for high current draw, but not capacity. So if you drain those to zero, they won't last very long. Like your car battery will die if you let it drain once. You pretty much need to replace it. Um, so that, that's one thing to keep in mind. The sealed types all generally don't last very long. Um, we'll talk about it a little bit on the next slide. Uh, flooded cells can last very long, um, but they're really sensitive, right? They have a li liquid electrolyte, not a gel of any type. They have to be kept upright. Um, this picture here on the right shows you a huge 200 amp hour um, uh, pack for a, a battery backup system for a public safety system. Um, again, each of these cells is 2.1 volt, volts. Right, so again, you can see those six cells here in series gives you that 12 volt system. So I love that, like you can always see that mental model working here as well. Um, but one of these cells is 200 amp hours. So this is a big battery, right? Um, and these are flooded and you can actually see the plates inside here. 
with the lead inside there and the clear electrolyte, which is actually a good, good, good sign. It means the battery is in good condition. This one has to get regularly topped off. You have outgassing concerns, et cetera, et cetera. But these can last 20 plus years um, if they're well maintained. Um, so those are still commonly used in, in industry. Um, overall, lead acid, very, very sensitive to deep discharge. You can't give that full rated capacity like we talked about. Typically, you derate them to like 50% depth of discharge, um, where you only use half of the capacity of a lead acid battery when you're using it. So if you bought 100 amp hour lead acid, you really only expect to get 50 amp hours out of it. Um, and even at 50 amp hours, like if you only discharge at 50%, you're only getting 500 cycles out of it if you're lucky, right? So there's a cycle count issue here. If you use this in an off-grid battery scenario, 500 cycles, if you're cycling the battery every day because you're running your house off of lead acid batteries, that's just over a year of usage before you have to replace your battery pack. Now, that's a little aggressive. You usually don't design it that extreme. You have a smaller depth of discharge, um, but that's definitely something to consider. Um, they have a low gravimetric en energy density, which is just a fancy way of saying they have lead in them and they're really heavy, right? Um, and I mentioned they only have a five-year shelf life. Uh, that's for the sealed types. And that's really key, actually, especially as amateur radio operators. If you're going and buying one of these or getting one at a flea market, check the date codes and ask for a discount, right? If you go to Home Depot and try to buy a lead acid battery that's sitting on their shelf, check the date code. If it's 2021 and the date code is from 2018, ask for an 80% discount or a 70, 60% discount. Uh, I see, I'm curious if they'll give it to you. Um, but pretty much say, hey, the manufacturer says this thing's only good for five years and you've had this on your shelf for three years. Um, I would like a 60% discount on this thing because it's already expired largely, right? Uh, it should be on the cheap discount rack in the back at that point. Um, and if you're getting used batteries from a source, like the Cal Poly Image Radio Club got used batteries from, their, from the fire alarm systems, the state of California required them, I think at four or five years, they had to replace the batteries because they're end of life. We could still get anywhere from six months to three years out of those batteries, um, depending on how well they'd been treated, how hot of an environment they were in, how much they'd been discharged. Um, so you have to kind of keep an eye on it. Overall, they are cheap, they're red readily available, but total cost of ownership can actually be higher for lead acid. So as of 2021, when we're giving this talk, uh, lead acid is not usually the cheapest option anymore. Um, when you look at something that you're going to be using for a longer period of time, and especially if you're going to be cycling it, um, it's really not no longer the cheapest option, which is kind of interesting because everyone still says, oh, they're so cheap. OK. Um, briefly, yeah, lead acid's great because you can just plug it straight into things, right? Because it's 12 volts and it just works with your radios, you can literally plug a radio directly into it, and it's generally OK. Um, the one thing I do want to point out, um, so there are things like the West Mountain Radio makes like the Super Power Gate, which is just a battery charger and switcher for like a battery backup. Some people might have these at home for their shack. Um, the one thing that they miss on this is an under voltage protection. So we talked about it earlier, lead acid batteries really don't like being discharged to zero. It damages the chemistry irreversibly and it affects the capacity irreversibly, just like your car battery is much worse off after you've ever drained it once. Um, you really need to have some sort of under voltage protection in there. Um, PowerGuard sell or the uh, West Mountain Radio sells what's known as a PowerGuard Plus, 115 bucks, and that goes in series with the battery to disconnect the battery if it ever gets below a certain voltage threshold. Um, you absolutely should get one of those or a cheaper eBay equivalent, which is just a relay with a voltage comparator that disconnects the battery if it ever gets um, too low, so that you don't accidentally leave the radio on, power goes out, or you disconnect the power supply and it kills the battery, and then you literally have to buy buy a new battery. Really bad experience. So. Under voltage lockout, get one. Okay, any questions so far? This is kind of the lead acid section. Now we get into the lithium stuff. Um, I have a question. Yeah, David. Um, how what what voltage should you look for? I've got I I have a lead acid batteries, and I have a voltmeter that's on it, in, so that I can keep track of the current and the voltage. What uh, where should I when should I stop using a lead acid battery? What what voltage? Yeah, so it, it's a little bit chemistry dependent. So depending on if it's a, a gel cell or an AGM, um, they have slightly different chemistries. You can look up the data sheet for that particular battery. That's generally my recommendation if you can find it. Um, otherwise, there's some general guidance online. Um, if we go back to the actual nominal cell voltage, right? there's a typical minimum of like 1.3 to 1.8. So at six cells, that's in the like 10 to 12 volt, to 10 to, 10 to 11 volt range typically where you'd want to um, be sitting. Um, if, again, 
the less the less you discharge them, the longer they last. And that's kind of the trick with lead acid as well, is that you really don't want to discharge them too far. Um, so if you don't need to, um, don't discharge them further than you need to. Um, and that's, that's again, with no load, right? As soon as you attach a load to it and you're starting to pull current, expect that voltage to drop significantly. Um, and that's just because of the internal resistance and the resistance in your cables. Yeah, I've run, I've run uh, my batteries for a couple hours and uh, I see no appreciable uh, voltage drop, no more than about 10th of a volt. And I got some old batteries too. So I guess I got a good, well, most of them are all free for me, but. Yeah, no, and that's great. I make sure that I don't run them down too far because that makes them useless. Yeah, you. I mean, if you're, if you're just doing a standby and if you're monitoring, right, it's low current, excuse me, a lot of radios might only be pulling a couple hundred milliamps on, on receive or standby. Those those can sit. That's less than you know 0.1 C discharge on those radios on those batteries. Sorry, that could run for days sometimes, right? Depending on on what your actual discharge rate is. Um, as soon as you start transmitting, duty cycle plays a factor. How much power you're pulling. Um, if you're hooking up an inverter to it and running a laptop, a laptop's now pulling 100 watts or 150 watts. Um, that's more than 10 amps um, from your battery. So suddenly that 10 amp hour battery is now being run at 1 C, right? So that, that really you have to look at how big the battery is, how much your load is, and then kind of make a decision for how long it can run. All right, thank you. I have yep. a question. You uh, you passed over there was a slide with a battery tender in there. Uh, you say anything about battery tenders, uh, Marcel? Whoop. Yeah, uh, battery tenders are great. I have several. Um, if you have 12 volt batteries and you have a battery tender, leave them connected. Um, battery tenders have, I think, four stage charging on most of them where they go to, you know, they properly charge it, they flow charge it, and then they go to a kind of a, a resting state and keep it fully charged. Um, they'll also do desulfation and stuff to help increase the longevity of those packs. Um, especially during pandemic, actually, every like two to three months, I would hook up a battery tender to both my car battery and my motorcycle battery and leave it connected for at least 24 or 48 or 72 hours um, just to top it off, let it fully charge, let it desulfate, let it just be happy. Um, when I brought the car to the dealer the next time, it was much happier because they run their battery test and um, it's desulfated, it has lower resistance. So it just makes your packs a lot happier. So for lead acid, if you aren't leaving them plugged into something else, um, get a battery tender, leave them hooked up. Uh, it's a great idea. People use them all the time for overwintering their um, off-road vehicles and stuff. Is there any difference between the aircraft battery tender and the automotive tender? I haven't looked at the details of the aircraft one, so I can't speak to that particularly. Um, if it's designed for lead acid, um, it's probably fine. Um, but like I said, there's a little difference with AGM versus gel cell and some like the West Mountain Radio, the power gate has a jumper inside to switch between AGM or SLA. Um, just a slight different voltage targets. Their newer Epic power gate um, is also programmable for different specific voltages. And that just makes it a little bit happier for um, for those batteries so that you're right on the money. Question. Um, yes. These are, let me see if you can see the image. Uh, these are ones I get at the local um, battery store up the street. Yep. Uh, what's your assessment of these? Sealed lead acid gel cell, pretty standard 12 volt, seven amp hour battery. Um, they fall in the lead acid category. They work just fine. Uh, you can't pull high current from them. So with a seven amp hour battery, you really don't want to be running a mobile radio at full power because then you're pulling, you know, eight or ten or twelve amps off of it. Um, it really won't be happy with that. If you're running a lower power thing, or if you're back, you know, lower power radio, you're running it at five or ten watts. It'll be fine. Um, you yeah, can probably run a, a half day I'm, on it. Yeah, I'm running QRP at uh, five or yeah. ten watts. Yeah, that should be fine. I mean, and they're they're cheap, like you said, right? Especially if you can get your hands on them. It's a good way to just, um, yeah, run parks on the air or something. Yeah, that's exactly what I, what I yeah. use it for. Okay. How much time do you say I get out of it? Uh, it really depends on your usage. Um, there are a couple of good calculators. I think West Mountain Radio has one. I know that uh, BioNO has one as well on their website where you can actually plug in your radio, the power that you're using in your duty cycle, because that's really the key thing. So depending on how much you're transmitting and what power you're transmitting at, and then how much time you're spending receiving, they'll give you effectively an average power number that you can then calculate um, what, what the effective usage will be. Um, roughly, if you're running, we can do the rough math, right? If it's a seven, a seven amp hour battery, we derate it by 50%. So that's three and a half amp hours. If you're running five watts QRP, that's, roughly like 
a third of an amp. So that's nine hours of transmit in theory, right? Super rough. Mm -hmm. Did I okay. do that math right? Probably didn't, but okay. plug it in a calculator. That's that's the rough calculation you'd be doing. That's, that's more that's more than I'm out there for. That's good. Yeah, and and it really it, it again totally depends. If you double your your transmit power, even if your duty cycle is the same, uh, you just uh, probably have your runtime, right? Thank you. And that's assuming the batteries are good and they're not old and they don't droop too much and start browning out on your transmit. Cool. I have a question. Yeah, Marvin. Uh, how can you tell by looking at the battery? I bought one uh, for my car and it does not say anything about AGM or standard battery. Is there any way to look at it and tell what kind of battery you got? Uh, kind of. So uh, like flooded cells are pretty straightforward because you can see that they have vented caps or removable caps on them where you could actually fill up the electrolyte and you can still get those for your cars and motorcycles and stuff and ski -doos. I don't know if you have ski -doos down in Atlanta, but um, uh, you would that you could have caps that are removable. That would be a flooded chemistry typically. Um, the, like a lot of them are gonna, like if it's automotive, it's often gonna be AGM. It, it's probably not gonna be a gel cell in that application. Um, gel cells don't like being hot as much either. Um, but you'll see like the backup batteries, like the one that Bob was showing or the ones that you find for like automated uh, gate closing or like little off-grid solar or backup battery lights or that sort of thing, those will typically be um, sealed lead acid or some sort of gel cell. Um, you kind of have to look it up and sometimes, yeah, the cheaper manufacturers might not state it and yeah. <clears throat> they don't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can check if they say like what their to charge voltage is, you can compare that against others and that <clears throat> have reputable manufacturers and data sheets on them um, and then match those together. Like this battery here, this is one where it says AGM right on top, right? So that one's pretty clear, um, but not all cells will say that. Are you going to talk about uh, charging requirements? Because uh, AGM and a standard uh, flooded cell uh, are, do have different charging, uh, uh, yep. don't they? Yeah, I, I briefly mentioned that just so like the power gate has a separate jumper for AGM versus SLA, right? And it, because the chemistries do have slightly different top of charge voltage, they do have a slightly different <laughs> charge profile that they're trying to target. Um, like when we actually look at this, the maximum charge you'll see here, like between 2.35 or 2.45 volts per cell, and that's kind of chemistry dependent, is the max charge, right? So depending on the chemistry, you don't want to overcharge it. Lead acid's not as sensitive to a slight overcharge or over discharge. Um, but it is definitely something you want to keep in mind. So if you are getting a specific battery, always make sure you're getting the charger that matches that battery chemistry. Within a chemistry family, it's less critical, but within, like, but you definitely need to get within that chemistry family. So don't use a lead acid charger on a lithium battery pack ever, right? So that's like, just make sure you're keeping those separate. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Yep. Um, one brief mention here, and then we'll move on to the next section for the interest of time. Um, I can stick around longer. I just want to make sure we're not keeping everyone here too long. Uh, this is a 108 amp hour battery. Uh, it's 74 pounds in a milk crate with a battery backup, a power supply, and a little uh, uh, under voltage lockout. So with all those together, that's like 75 pounds. It's not light, right? So if you're schlepping this to field day, you need want two people um, or a hand cart. Otherwise, you're going to pull your back. So uh, it's just something to always keep in mind. Lead is heavy. OK. Uh, fun next step. So lithium ion, this is the, the crux of the presentation. So uh, lithium ion batteries came around in the 1970s. So this is like 100 years later, right, that we came up with lithium ion chemistry. So it gives you an idea. They're relatively new, right? Um, this is when they started showing up in lab environments. They really only started hitting mainstream in the last like decade or so, um, or 15, 20 years, uh, when they really started getting a much, much more use and becoming really mainstream. Um, typically, they use what's known as a jelly roll construction, um, and that gives you a really large surface area. So instead of just stacking the plates on top of each other, like we saw in the lead acid where they just had plates next to each other, you now take thin foils and you coat them with your electrolyte and you roll them up, right? So this picture on the bottom left, this is an unrolled je jelly roll cell. Um, you can see, I think it's probably copper and then the lithium um, in there and like all the different pieces that roll up with a separator. Um, and this allows you to get really, really high specific energy compared to lead acid. So it's almost four times the energy density in the same space, right? So 
that same battery size and weight, right, for a lead acid versus a lithium battery chemistry, four times difference, right? So that 75 pound battery that you sh just slept to field day, if you had to carry four of them before, now you only have to carry one um, if it's lithium. So huge difference. That's really one of the big savings. Um, that's why RC aircraft and that sort of thing really, really like these, the remote control planes and stuff, love lithium batteries and lithium polymer because they have this really, really high energy density. Um, not anything close to fuel. Fuel is still an order of magnitude higher than that, like gasoline and stuff, but um, you have great energy efficiency here as well. Um, so the, the nominal cell voltage here is now way higher. It's like 3.6 volt is kind of typical. Um, it, depending on the specific chemistries, anywhere kind of from three volts to four, four and a half volts is the range that you'll typically have for nominal chemistries for uh, lithium ion. Um, there are a bunch of different chemistry types. Um, I'm not going to go into all of them today, uh, but there's the kind of L LCO and MC, LMO, LFP. Those are like lithium cobalt oxide, uh, nickel, manganese, cobalt, lithium, manganese oxide, and lithium ferrophosphate or lithium iron phosphate. That's the one we'll be talking about next. Um, that's particularly interesting to amateur radio. Um, most uses you'll see these days, like NMC is a very, very common um, type. Uh, you'll see that in you know power cells, in, in uh, laptops, power tools, electric vehicles, et cetera. Um, really, really common. Uh, some more exotic ones like LTO, uh, lithium titanate oxide, um, those have weird chemistries that have different performance characteristics. So depending on what they're doing, people are tweaking these, but these all fall into the one big bucket of lithium ion batteries, right? So if someone says, oh, I have a lithium ion battery, great. What kind, right? That's kind of my next question. <laughs> um, typical form factor. So two main categories that I talk about here, one is pouch cells. That's this picture on the bottom left. That's what's typical inside your phones, your tablets, your handheld radios, your RC planes, your quadcopters. Um, pouch cells are very, very common. They're literally, you take that jelly roll, you squish it flat, and you put in a little sleeve and seal it up um, and have two leads coming out of it. That's a pouch cell. Uh, they're easy to poke, and then you have fire, right, if you poke a hole in them. Um, so they're not the strongest, but they're very cheap to make, and you can make them in different sizes and shapes. So everyone that has a cell phone near them, you have a pouch cell within arm's reach of you, um, almost guaranteed. Uh, cylindrical cells, the other common one, uh, the 18650 size, that's the smaller one. I know I have my green screen on, but that's the size on my face, right? 18650 um, uh, or 21700, that's the more uh, the one that you're hearing a lot more about because Tesla is starting to use that and build those um, or even larger ones. Um, the, si the numbers there are actually the size. So 18650 is 18 millimeter diameter and 65 millimeters long. Right, so 21700 is slightly thicker at 21 millimeters diameter and 70 millimeters long, right? Um, so as you see those numbers shift, you can see how, how those change in size. Your typical power tool batteries, so your Ryobis, your DeWalt's here in the bottom right, one of those packs will have a number of these cells in it, right? So for their 12 volt battery or their 20 volt max, they're gonna have like four or seven batteries in there likely uh, to get those voltage ranges. So that's kind of interesting. So key thing about lithium ion batteries and the chemistry overall is it's extremely sensitive to over voltage and over current events that cause thermal runaway or uh, RD, rapid disassembly, um, or whatever terminology you'd like to use for a small explosion, right? Um, you've heard about all of these, they're fun stories. They're always interesting to read about and fascinating failure analysis reports, at least for battery nerds like myself, to see like, why did these things fail? Um, what went wrong and, and how did that happen? And typically all of that can get brought back down to over voltage or over current events or some sort of thermal runaway. Um, so in order to protect against that, you need to have protection circuits built in. And this is critical, right? So for your battery chargers, you need millivolt accuracy when you're charging lithium. For lead acid, we were talking about it earlier as well. Like if you charge an SLA at an AGM battery, it's not the end of the world. Um, some of those chargers actually intentionally overcharge to do what's like charge balancing or desulfation for, for lead acid batteries. Um, it won't cause that battery to blow up usually, uh, unless you actually boil the electrolyte in a flooded battery. Um, but for lithium, like some batteries like might be operating at a higher voltage, like 4.35 volts per cell. If you go up just by 50 millivolts, right? You sneeze at your power supply and just turn the knob a little bit. That can be enough to cause that cell to go thermal runaway, right? So that's, that's the sort of accuracy you need. And this is why it's so critical. Like if you ever hear anyone don't charge a battery off a power supply at your bench, they mean it, right? Unless you have a locked power supply that's current limited and voltage limited and that voltage limited set to the battery's max or below the battery's max, then you can safely do it. 
but any other time be super, super careful. So when you're doing multi-cell packs now, because of that millivolt accuracy, you need what's known as a battery management system, a BMS, or sometimes a PCM, a protection circuit module. Um, that's a circuit like these boards shown below that make sure that individual cells in the pack as a whole doesn't have that, those voltage inaccuracies cause any issues. So at a minimum, this battery management system or BMS needs to have over voltage protection, OVP, over current protection, OCP, and over temperature protection, over OTP, right? So these protections are critical so you don't have those over voltage, over current, or over temperature events that cause the battery to go boom, right? So uh, when you look at this one on the bottom left, these four yellow ones, those are cells modeled here. So this is a four cell battery pack. You'll notice how there's a pack negative on the left and a pack positive on the right, but then you have individual voltage taps between each cell. Right, and this is critical. This is the battery management system individually measuring the cell voltages. Every single cell has a voltage tap on it to make sure that no cell ever exceeds that millivolt accuracy maximum voltage, right? So as you're charging this pack, because otherwise what happens if you start charging this pack at two amps charge or whatever, and as you're getting close to the top of charge, one of these cells is slightly higher voltage than the others. If you don't individually voltage measure it, your total pack might be okay, but one of those cells might have gone too high, your pack just went boom, right? So what the battery management system does is it will measure those voltages. And if it ever goes too high on any one of those cells, it'll turn off and say, stop charging me uh, and throw a fault, right? And that's a huge thing. It's really, it's actually a really nice feature because effectively when you buy these lithium ion battery packs like from BioNO, they're fully protected. They do all of this themselves. They have all these protections built in. They handle it. And if there's ever a problem, they turn off, right? They, they fail safe, which is great. Um, for the fancier ones, you'll add additional features like under voltage lockout, cell balancing, fuel gauging. Um, cell balancing makes sure that those cells are identical. If they're ever above or below each other, it'll push current from one to the other so that it can get the voltages more equal. Um, fuel gauging is what your cell phone does. It's just a battery percentage, right? Um, instead of reading the voltage to know how much capacity you have left, it'll actually give you a percentage. So I can pull up on my phone app actually and tell you, hey, my battery pack's sitting at 76% capacity, which is great if you're doing an event or you're running field day or on the air, you know, oh, should I go to the next summit? Do I have enough charge to still make some QSOs? Um, so it's super useful. Um, pros and cons. So 3.6 volts obviously doesn't equal 13.8. So we'll talk about that a little bit more on how you can actually get this voltage to match for 13.8 volts. Um, but they can be really, really good for custom applications. So just like your cell phone runs on typically one um, cell, uh, your HTs will do the same thing, right? So this lovely little Motorola HT has a 7.2 volt battery inside it, um, which is two of these cells in series. So it's 3.6 volts times two. So if you have two of those cells, um, you can create a nice voltage. And if the HT is designed for that voltage range, it's great. Just like your cell phone is designed to use a, a lithium ion chemistry, then it's all fine and dandy. Um, we talked about bullet three, hazardous at high cell voltages. If you overcharge them, it's bad. Um, typical chemistry, cycle count. This is always something that people ask about. Um, typical lithium ion chemistries from the manufacturer only rated to like three or 500 cycles to a 70% capacity. Um, so that means mm. if it was a 1000 milliamp hour cell, if you cycle it 300 times, now it's only a 700 milliamp hour cell. So over time, it loses its capacity. So for most amateur radio applications, that's not an issue really the cycle count, because even if you're using it every weekend, that's 50 cycles a year, that pack will last you 10 years before you end up getting to 500 cycles. And then it's still 70% of its capacity, that's fine. But if you're using this in like an off-grid solar setup and you're running a repeater on a mountaintop without any power source, you're cycling that battery every day. Oh, now we run into that problem where, hey, after one year, that battery is down to 70% capacity. And that actually makes a big difference. So that's something you need to plan for because they don't have the highest cycle life. And that's running from zero to 100%. So um, that's a discharge picture here on the bottom right. This is for a Sony VTC5 cell, actually the one I have here, right? At 10 amp discharge um, and then uh, charging it at four amps and between you know whatever two and a half volts to 4.2 volts after 300 cycles, it's gone down to whatever percentage of the capacity that was down to like 2,100 milliamps hours from 2,600 milliamp hours. Um, pros, high energy density, um, low cost per amp hour. So these things are getting dirt cheap now um, for regular lithium ion chemistries and you can just get, get them everywhere. Um, they're used everywhere. They're really stable technology at this point. Everyone's making them um, and that's really, really helpful. Okay, um, when we talk about- Yeah, 
Quick question, Rob. It's a quick one. I uh, mailed a, uh, I shipped a laptop today and I had to put all these UN warnings on there because of the batteries. And I was yep. just wondering what, what is the threat there? Yeah, a great question. So there's a UN 38.3, if you wanna read up on it and take some webinars, it's fascinating. Um, talks about shipping batteries um, and, and what to do with batteries. Um, and then there are several UN classifications for different types of batteries and how you're shipping them and transporting them internationally. Um, the IATA, Dot org, International oh, Aeronautical Transportation Authority, something like that. Um, they have a nice little page on lithium battery shipping. And the main thing there, so there's, there's two things. One is if you're shipping a bare cell, so a cell that doesn't have any protection circuits on it um, and is not in a housing, like if you're just shipping a pouch cell by itself, um, it's super dangerous, right? Because if that package gets dropped and another box drops on top of it and it even just slightly bends or punctures that cell, if that cell is fully charged, that could set it off, right? And that when that one cell gets set off, you have, there are a number of incidents you can read about it where cargo planes have been brought down because there was a battery that went off in it, right? Um, and just like, I mean, you think about it like the Ford Pintos or whatever, right? Where a, a fuel tank goes off. You can't ship a gallon of gasoline in a box in UPS either. Um, I think of lithium batteries as little hand grenades, to be perfectly honest. That's just my mental model for safety and sanity when I'm working with them. Like I'm holding this one very carefully right now. I know you can't quite see it, right? But I'm holding it very carefully right now because I'm like, yeah, I don't want to short it. I want to make sure it's, it's well protected and it's not getting pierced. I don't drop it on anything hard or sharp. Um, because it's dangerous. So those those stickers alert the carriers that this is hazardous material, right? Um, just like other batteries that you ship as well. Uh, if you're shipping a bottle of bleach as well, you have to do the same thing. You have to label it. If you're shipping pepper spray, you have to label it. Um, and yeah, shipping a battery either uh, in equipment or outside of equipment makes a difference whether or not it's protected and how much of it you're shipping. Um, if you're shipping bare cells that are fully charged, they're super restricted. You can only ship them by ground with a special carrier with all sorts of rules. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answered your question, but that's kind of uh, the question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I'd be happy to deep dive that later too. I've <laughs> done a lot of shipping myself, including figuring out how to ship larger batteries. Um, and there are different limits depending on how many you're shipping, how big they are, uh, and what kind of chemistries they are. Um, so that's always fun. Is there another question or is that just a res residual hand from Bob? It's a residual hand, okay. Um, okay, so lithium ion integration. So when you create battery packs, um, we put the packs together in series and parallel strings of cells. So if you remember back to electrical engineering 101, your technician exam, remember series and parallel voltages. Um, when we talk about packs, we talk about S and P configurations of cells, right? So it's the number of series and parallel cells that you put together to make a battery pack. So here on the left, this is a picture of a 1S3P battery pack. So we have one series battery and then three in parallel. So these are all gonna be shorted at one end or the other end. This will make a 3.6 volt nominally battery pack, but the capacity will be three times of the individual cell. So if each cell here is 1000 milliamp hours, this will be a 3000 milliamp hour pack at 3.6 volts, all right? So that's a 1S3P. This one here on the right is a 3S2P. So there are three cells in series and two in parallel, right? So if that's two in parallel, again, if these are 1000 milliamp hour cells, now that's 2000 milliamp hours total, and it's three in series. So instead of 3.6 volts, we're now at 10.8 volts nominal. So it's a 10.8 volt, 2000 milliamp hour pack, right? And I think it's an important mental model to understand this terminology. You'll see things like 4S1P or 7S10P. If you just multiply the numbers together, you know how many individual cells are in there. Right, so a 3S2P is six cells, right? As you see in the picture, um, and that's a really key thing when you start talking about lithium batteries when you're building them out of cells. If you look at some of the big packs, like in Teslas or in Powerwalls or whatever else, um, they start getting pretty high series numbers. Like e-bikes will be anywhere from 11 to 15 series, right? And you know, three to six in parallel. So those are big packs, higher voltage, right? Okay, so if we do that and now apply it to our 13.8 volt model, thinking back to we're trying to get this 13.8 volt plus or minus 15%, how do we get there? Well, if you take three in series, you're gonna end up with a 10.8 volt nominal 
and at the low end it's nine volts and at the high end it's 12.6 so at the high end you could use this and you could start charging your mobile radios but it's not going to be great you really need some sort of boost converter to push that voltage up so you can hook up a boost converter push it up to 13.8 volts fine i've seen people do this um downside is that you have a a boost converter and b your much higher current on the battery side because it's lower voltage so it's going to be a higher current for the same amount of power um, a 4s pack works out pretty well 14.4 volts nominal so that's right there in the range at the low end it's 12 volts when it cuts out that's still within range oh but at the high end it's 16.8 volts so this could be a problem for some radios right if your radio's max is 15.87 and you're pushing a volt higher than that that could blow up the input circuit right but your mileage may vary so check the radio right if you're planning on it you can get really cheap 4s like lithium ion batteries for our seek planes and i've seen plenty of people that use them for parks on the air for soda for whatever um but they've confirmed that that radio can handle 16.8 volts. Um, the other option is use a bucker boost converter and or, or some like series diode or something to limit the voltage. It gets a little bit tricky, um, or you could just not charge it as full. So if you only charge it to 13.95 volts roughly times four gets you just below that 15.87, um, you could actually do that. You lose about 10 to 20% capacity, but that might be about the same that you'd lose by using a voltage converter in there. Right. So I've actually seen people do this. They buy a, a charger that charges it right up to the maximum that their radio can take and no higher. They still attach power poles to it and then just plug it in just fine. Um, you just have to be very careful that you never charge it to 16.8 volts and then plug it into something that can't handle that voltage because then you just blew up an expensive radio. Right. So keep that in mind. Marcel, got a question? Yes. Jim, go ahead. Um, if you're running a uh, high peak configuration and one of the cells happens to go bad, um, what is the uh, effect of it putting the other good cells into a high current um, discharge? Yeah, so if, if you have multiple cells in parallel in a pack, so let's say a 7S10P pack, right? I've got that here, I'll show it in a minute. Okay. Um, if one of those cells fails, and most typically they fail short circuit, yeah. um, that is now a short with nine other cells in parallel. So those nine cells are gonna dump all of their energy into that one cell. So one cell, and if these are power cells, these cells can do, I think, 25 amps discharge each, right? So 25 amps times nine is now what you're dumping into one cell. And what do you think happens when you put that much current into one cell? Yeah, we have a thermal run with our own. <laughs> exactly, right. Well, with so, the, um, the um, battery menders, the... Uh, management management system? Management yeah. systems. Are they watching for uh, cell, cell failure? Uh, yeah. Yes, they are, but it depends on how they're set up. So if you have a high peak configuration, if you just have a voltage tap on that node, all the battery management system is going to see is it's going to see a voltage drop, right? When that happens, because okay. the others are going to dump their drop. current into it. It's yeah. going to, it won't see any current motion because the current's all within that parallel string. There's nothing right. going through the pack. Um, and yeah, it might not catch it. So okay. typically if you're building a high P pack, so a high parallel configuration pack, um, you'll want to individually fuse the cells. So individual cells, you actually put a fuse on it so that cell never gets its ra individual rating exceeded. So one of my friends, he builds big packs by himself. He runs individual fuse wire to each cell, sometimes only three amp or five amp fuse wire to an individual cell. So if you ever have a cell fail short, it'll take three amps and it'll heat up a little bit, but three amps won't be enough necessarily to blow up that cell. So that gotcha. pack Makes will sense. still work. You just occasionally have to look for failed fuse wire. And but if to you know get a full failed. thermal runaway or a full dead short, they'll put enough resistance and uh, burn your link out. Gotcha. Yeah, it'll either burn out the link or it'll heat up the pack or worst case, it'll start going boom, boom, boom. Um, cells like 18650s have um, thermal vent caps on them. Where's my camera right there, right? Um, and it'll actually start outgassing before it explodes. Um, and if it works well, they have, let's uh, call it a, a a thermal lid in there effectively so it, it starts out gassing before it actually explodes on you and generally if you're buying legitimate cells from good vendors where they don't put fake protections in them right some of the cheap knockoffs those aren't actually real thermal protections so you have to be a little bit careful um but yeah not to scare you but that's if you're building your own packs so <laughs> appreciate you clarifying yeah absolutely um so if you go with a higher c a higher s capacity if you go with like 5s or greater you pretty much always need some sort of buck converter um, and, and that, that works out, right? 18 volt nominal, but, um, you know, for a 5S, but you just buck convert it and you can actually get pretty high efficiencies. So I'll show that briefly. 
On this table, I like it just kind of visually. So the first column here is mobile radio that shows you that 11.7 to 15.9. That's what we're trying to target. Lead acid, you can see how it sits pretty low in that range, right? And how you lose that bottom end of the capacity pretty quick. 3S lithium ion, even worse. It's sitting way down there. Excuse me, 4S, actually pretty good, right? Just that 10, 20% that's sitting above the upper limit. But you could actually use a 4S lithium ion pretty comfortably. And 5S usually sits outside of that range. Right, so th this I think is just a really helpful visual for me to kind of see how those different voltages line up with that mobile radio range that we're going for. Okay, I'm um, actually building these pretty straightforward. You build a battery pack, you add a BMS, and then you add a voltage converter. These are ones uh, I built this last row here, so we'll show that one. Um, this is a DIY Powerwall battery pack. Raw. There we go. It's a little heavy, right? So it's a nice big briefcase. Um, we can turn on the meter on the front as well. So it's got a little voltage meter, tells you, oh, sitting at 28 volts right now um, and no current flow. So that's good fun. Uh, this one is built off of the DIY power community, Powerwall community. So there's actually a group of folks online that build their own battery backups for their house, um, kind of like the Tesla Powerwall or similar products. Um, this one was designed by Jayho Garcia and actually my college roommate, Justin Kenny, KJ6 KST, did the layout for him. Um, it's a pretty neat circuit layout where they have fusing for individual wires in there that's at the board level. Um, and this is a 7S10P. So we talked about that earlier. Um, there are a lot of cells inside, right? So there are seven, each of those black metal rows has seven cells and there are 10 of those in parallel. Um, and then there's a buck converter on it. Uh, so total capacity for this battery pack is about 20 amp, 28 amp hours or about 650 watt hours. Um, and we have this 30 amp buck converter. So I can run an HF rig plus a UHF VHF rig, both at full power transmit with no problems. Um, and it's a wide input buck converter, right? So it has an 18 to 36 volt input and the battery pack goes from 21 to 29 volts. So it's right inside that window um, and it can make sure that it can handle that. Um, I won't go into too much detail here, but it's just kind of neat to see if you're building a pack like this. This is the block diagram I put together. It's always helpful to document it. The key pieces here again, the batteries themselves, the battery management system, and then the DC to DC buck converter, right? Those are really the three pieces. The rest of it is all extra stuff. Power pull outlets, USB ports, a charge port, a disconnect switch, a voltage and a current monitoring system, right? Those are all bells and whistles, depending on what you want to build. But fundamentally, it's a battery with a battery management system and then a buck converter. And you can do this. Um, works out pretty well. It's pretty expensive if you're building it from scratch and buying the cells, right? These cells are like five bucks each and they're actually harder to find these days because people aren't making them as much. Um, so like 600 bucks to build that battery. Um, I salvage my cells so you could get them from used laptop batteries or from other places. Um, you can get them and just test them individually. There's a whole community that does that online. Um, so you can get that down to about half the price. This box weighs about 17 pounds total, right? So you talk about the total pack weight is is higher than just the cell weight, right? So the, there's the integration cost associated with building a pack like this. Whereas lead acid, you can just take it and plug it straight in. You're, you're adding the battery management system, you're adding the cell holders, you're adding you know, the buck converter weight, the switch weight, all of those things add to the total weight. So if you're a parks on the air or a soda person, right? And you're running up mountains, I wouldn't want to schlep this box up the hill, right? I'd build something smaller and, and more discreet. Uh, a brief aside, uh, efficiency is good to calculate, right? So uh, it's a 30 amp buck converter. When we run it at about one amp output current, I get about 87% efficient, which is not great, but at the lower current range, that's kind of expected. Up higher, I could only pull 22 amps from it with an HF rig and a VHF UHF rig running at full power. Um, and I was able to get uh, about 96% efficient. So that's pretty good actually, right? So for a buck only converter, um, you can get pretty high efficiencies when it's running at high rates. Back to one of the earlier questions, if you're running in the park all day and you're generally sitting on receive or you're not doing a lot of transmit, you're going to be sitting at that lower efficiency, right? So you have to actually use different efficiency depending on your power draw um, when you're calculating this for your, if you're like trying to figure out a power budget for your system. Um, but yeah, that's pulling 300 watts from that box and it does that all day long, just fine and dandy. It's pretty happy with that. Uh, discharge curve, I always love doing this. This is a Westmount Radio CBA4 power battery analyzer. Um, and it's pretty funny since it's a regulated output at 13.8 volts, it's just a flat line, right? So it's a flat line, flat line, flat line, flat line until the battery management system says, oh, voltage is low and then it drops to zero, right? So it's a hilarious discharge curve, which is for all the battery nerds, I think Dave, Dave's chuckling there. I'm sure other people are, think that's funny. Um, uh, we're getting, I calculated about 90% efficiency at this five amp discharge based on the other numbers. It should run for about 
eight and a half, nine hours at 70 watts. Um, and we got, you know, we measured 608 watt hours and I had calculated 590 watt hours. So it's pretty good, right? The measurements come back within, within a margin for what the pack does. So that's great. Um, at 13.8 volts, it's about 43 and a half amp hours equivalent battery, right? So, because this amp hour number here, this is at the higher voltage. You have to keep that in mind. Okay. That's lithium ion. Whew. And we're already getting at an hour. Sorry, guys. A lot of good questions. Okay, so last section now is lithium iron phosphate. This is what we've all been waiting for. Uh, sometimes called uh, LIFE PO4 or LIFEPO, as people will call it, or LFP. Um, that flows off the tongue a little bit easier for me. Lithium ferrophosphate, ferrous iron, same thing. Um, these only came around in 1996, right? So again, later. Um, so lithium ion was in like the 1970s, and now this is in 1996. So it's pretty new chemistry. Same jelly roll construction is generally used for them, um, but it's a different chemistry, right? So with this different chemistry, we have a different nominal voltage, and that's the key, right? This lower nominal voltage for lithium iron phosphate at 3.2 volt nominal means that when we put four of them and we stack them together, we get this beautiful 10 to 14.6 volt range, which really lands nicely in this voltage range for mobile radio. So it sticks out a little bit below, but that little bottom bit is really only like the last about 5% or so, like two, three, four, five percent of the battery capacity when you drip droop below the mobile radio input. Um, so really 95 plus percent of the capacity of the battery works natively as is with mobile radios, which is awesome. And this is why these have really exploded, bad use of that term. They've become really popular in the amateur radio community in the last, you know, five plus years. BioNO is one of the big players. They got onto that game early and got a lot of really good support for amateur radio. Um, so that's that's pretty neat. So with lithium iron phosphate types, they're highly available as 12 volt battery replacements, right? So you can just buy them with power poles literally on them. You can literally plug it directly into your radio, no problems. Um, and they come with all the protections built in, like we talked about earlier. Um, they've got the over voltage, the over temperature, the under voltage, the over current, and the balancing all built in. It's literally, this is a picture at actually at Pacificon, one of our conferences where BioNO had one of their batteries open. And this is the battery management system board sitting in there, right? So that's the actual individual cells um, all hooked up to this board and shows you how it works out. Um, quick pop quiz What is the battery configuration that you see here on the bottom left in SP with your left and right hands? 4S2P. Ding, 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 ding. 4S2P. Very good, right? The 4S should be a giveaway because that's lithium ion for a 12 volt battery pack. So it's eight cells here, but you can see they're in parallel, two in parallel with this battery tab between them. And again, they're alternating. So you can see there's a negative terminal, positive terminal, negative terminal, positive terminal, um, and that's hooked up in that configuration. Interestingly enough, a lot of BioNOS batteries are using this same cell. Um, I didn't mention it, but this cell actually here is, it's the same cylindrical cell format, but it's a slightly different dimension. So this is a 26650, right? So it's a 26 millimeter instead of 18, but the same length, 650 long. So like the 18650. So they're a little bit, chubbier um, cylindrical cells. This here is this nice rectangular shape. Um, this is a nice square shape. So can we guess what the capacity is of this battery pack? Or sorry, what the, um, the configuration is in this battery pack? Rob will get this one too, right? If this was a 4S2P and it's rectangular, now we put two of those next to each other. This is a 4S4P, right? So it's four in parallel. So to the other question earlier as well, you can start adding more and more in parallel. Um, you just have to make sure that they're assembled nicely and potentially fused. So hook them up directly, no DC to DC conversion needed. It's great. Um, other things that are great about lithium iron phosphate, they're intrinsically a safer chemistry than other lithium ion. So they don't blow up as easily. That's pretty much what that means. Uh, they, they, the electrolyte is less, uh, less volatile, right? Uh, the chemistry itself is happier and safer. It doesn't uh, discharge as much. So it has lower self-discharge. So you can let it sit for six months and it'll still be at 100% charge pretty much. Um, and they don't age as quickly. So you can get a lot, lot more cycles out of them. You can get thousands of cycles out of these instead of just hundreds. Someone want to get Tom there? Thanks. Um, so yeah, you can get thousands of cycles out of out of someone here instead of just hundreds. So uh, lithium iron phosphate, sometimes three, three to 5,000, even 10,000 cycles out of these packs, depending on the specifics of that, how that's made, um, versus just a couple hundred cycles out of lithium ion. So you can see like the solar community loves these because you can deploy these and they'll now run for 10 years instead of just two years, right? 
um, that's a big cost savings. That's a 5x cost savings just from time, even if the battery chemistry costs more initially. Uh, downside, uh, lower energy density. So like 360 versus 460 kilojoules per kilogram. So nowhere near as bad as lead acid, which was down in the hundreds or single digit, you know, hundred something, um, but not quite as good as uh, higher density lithium ion chemistries. And they're more expensive, um, but you have to look at kind of total integration costs, right? So these prices here are just off the shelf, like a lead acid, you can get them pretty cheap. Like a 20 amp hour can be $30 or something. A lithium ion equivalent, like a 3S8P would be about $120, um, but you have to add like a buck or a boost convert in there probably, and maybe different chargers and stuff. Lithium iron phosphate is drop in works as is, and that's 200 bucks is like off the shelf from BioNO for that sort of battery. Um, now keep in mind, this isn't accounting for a lead acid where you have to derate it by 2X, right? So an act to actually get 20 amp hours of capacity from a lead acid, you actually need to buy a 40 lead acid 40 amp hour lead acid battery. So double this, right? So that just got up to potentially $120, right? Oh, and it weighs four times as much. So now consider your medical bills and you already want to pay and buy the lithium, lithium iron phosphate, right? So, <laughs> um, or the extra back brace. So, and I can say that because I literally own a back brace and I have back problems too, so sorry. <laughs> um, so lithium iron phosphate applications. Great thing is you can just buy them, right? So kind of two options here, buy or build a pack. Um, we'll talk about buying a pack first. Biono is super popular. They just drop in replacements. They just work. Um, uh, I did that. I bought their little 20 amp hour battery and I put it in a nice little case with a nice little, you know, power pole ports and USB ports and a little switch to turn on the USBs and a little voltage monitor so you can see what the voltage is in there. Nice little cute Pelican case I had lying around. Um, and then inside it, you just keep the battery pack right? So battery pack, and then I keep the charger in there as well. So it's nice. It's all in there all at once. Um, I have little adapters in there as well, because it has like DC power jacks on the side and um, always keep an extension cable around, keep a USB cable in there. That's always key. Um, you're, you have this beautiful battery pack with these two beautiful USB ports. And then someone walks up and says, can I charge my phone? You say, sure, I've got a USB port. But if you don't have a cable for them, uh, they probably didn't come with one either if they're looking for a charger. So uh, keep charger cables. Um, mother battery pack, I keep a whole bag of cables in there because you always need them, right? So I literally have a pouch filled with different USB cables and stuff. <laughs> so uh, that's kind of a case. So $192 for the battery, you buy a hard case and the USB ports and the power poles and all this, you're actually looking at like another hundred bucks to build up that whole pack, right? So it's not particularly cheap when you actually think about it. Um, depends on what you want it. Some people, like if you're just doing like some on the air, you might just buy just the little like six amp power lithium iron phosphate and just take that with you up the mountain. Um, but if you actually want to build a nice case, and for me, there's kind of this go box kind of setup was more useful um, and making it rugged and like this, I can throw in the back of a pickup and not worry about it. If it's a bare pack, I might not want to be as rugged with it, as rough with it, because you don't want it to get damaged in the back of the car or get squished in something. Um, so kind of depends, but I also like keeping all the accessories with it and keeping the charger with it. So if I ever need to recharge it, it's easier to deal with. Um, nine and a half pounds, it's a 20 amp hour battery. So it's about half the capacity of the other one, um, similar rough weight per, um, per capacity. Okay, discharge test on this. I would like to do that because uh, depending on the cheapo vendors, they might actually not rate their cells properly. This one has a label that says it's 220 watt hours. When I actually did a discharge capacity test on it, 254 watt hours, which is awesome, right? So Biono does not um, under or oversell their packs. They they rate them correctly, and the packs are usually actually higher capacity than they actually are listed as, which is great. So uh, when you actually look at this, the other thing that's important to notice is this voltage curve. It's surprisingly flat, right? So for lithium iron phosphate specifically. While 14.6 volts is up here, that's the start of the charge curve. Really, most of the time here, this is 13 volts. It's really spent here between like 12 and a half and 13 volts. Um, and that's actually a, a challenge, right? So if you're using voltage to say how much juice do I have left in this battery, you're not really going to know. So if, if you tell me, hey, this battery is sitting at 12.9 volts, Marcel, how much time do I have left before it's empty? Oh, golly. So let's look at this chart, 12.9, well, somewhere in here. And it depends on if you're transmitting and pulling current at that time or not, right? So somewhere in here is what, like 20 to 50% capacity, somewhere in that range, which sure is a ballpark number, which is why I put the voltage meter on my, my battery pack, um, but it doesn't really give you a good judgment. So if you want more, you want to add fuel gauging. And I'll show you the other pack in a minute that has that. Um, 
And then the other comment here is that 11.7 volts is like right here. You can see this little last drop off. It's really steep. It's called the hockey stick or we're just like tanks at the end where the voltage drops really quickly. Really, there's no reason you're not going to really be operating down there because if you start transmitting, it'll droop voltage as well. So that last little couple of percent capacity, you're almost never going to use. So it really doesn't factor in much for the overall usage of that pack. You're probably packing up and going home anyway, unless you're trying to finish that last QSO. Okay, the other option is you build your own battery pack. This is Marcel's cup of tea. I love building battery packs. So this is one I built a year or two ago now. Um, I bought some prismatic cells on eBay. So 50 amp hour cells, 200 bucks. I bought a fancy Bluetooth BMS that um, connects to my cell phone, um, 73 bucks. Uh, PowerWorks actually gave me this nice bright orange box, which I absolutely love. Um, they didn't pay me to say this, but they did give me the box, so I have to disclose that, of course. Uh, but it's pretty, and it's big, and it's bright orange. So MCOM folks love this, right? It even has a nice little light on the front that you can like blind your audience, right? So uh, really nice. <laughs> and, um, tons of ports on the top. Uh, really kind of fun. Uh, I bought a BioNo charger for it just to have a nice charger that drops in the case. Um, the whole battery box with everything was about 506 bucks. If you compare that to the previous battery we built, which was, what do we say, 26 amp hour um, for a lithium ion. Um, now, again, these prices are for these particular integrations. Uh, this is definitely a cheaper option. And if you compare this to a BioNo battery where you buy it off the shelf ready built, 470 bucks versus 291 bucks for just the battery itself. Um, so it actually gets pretty cheap if you're building them yourself. These days, those prices have gone way down just in the last 12 months. Um, there are people building their own RV battery packs and stuff from cells you can get online um, surprisingly cheap these days. Um, do read reviews and check stuff because there's a lot of knockoff and B grade cells out there as well. Um, this is the inside, uh, really kind of fun. It's wired in there, it's got a little Bluetooth antenna going off the side. Again, keep chargers and cables inside uh, and just really, really fun. Uh, being a battery nerd, I love that it has this phone app so I can literally pull up the phone app um, and it auto connects to the battery and then tells you, hey, Marcel, your battery pack is 78%, right? So my battery pack's currently at 78%. It's got 38 amp hours remaining and the battery voltages are individually are 3.334 to 3.330 volts for the individual cell voltages, right? So battery nerds like me love that. You can turn on and off the pack from the app and like monitor your charge usage and how much power your radios are pulling and everything. So really kind of, super fun for us battery nerds. Um, and you can change all the settings here too. So I've got them set pretty conservatively just to be nice to the battery and not damage it. No reason to exceed limits. Um, gives you your cycle count as well. I'm up to 700 cycles on this pack. However, it counts those cycles, um, but that's good fun. I also had a USB uh, C charge port, a higher current one. So I can run laptops off it now too. Um, my wife uses this when we go sit in the park or go somewhere and we just want to watch a movie or, or work remotely and you want to be in the backyard, you just bring the battery pack and plug stuff in. It's great fun. Um, here's a discharge curve for it. Um, again, this pretty flat discharge curve you can see, and then it just tanks at the end. Total is about 52.5 amp hours. So again, higher than the rated cells, the cells I bought locally from Utah, um, and they uh, were well rated. So that's a good, good sign. Okay, and then drawing to a close, so we don't keep people here too long. Um, overall comparison table, and I don't know, these these are always high judgment. Um, you know, when you compare lead acid, lithium ion, and lithium iron phosphate, all of them have pros and cons. Um, these days, I would actually change some of these colors. So, like, cost per amp hour for lithium iron phosphate is actually going down. I mean, relative compared to the others, it's still a little bit more expensive. But if you're looking at total cost of ownership over time and what you're doing with it and not lugging around four times the weight in lead, literally. Um, I really cannot recommend that anyone for amateur radio buys anything other than lithium iron phosphate, right? So if you're gonna go buy a battery and you're gonna do parks on the air, you're gonna do anything, just get yourself lithium iron phosphate. You won't regret it. The thing works, they just work, they protect themselves. They won't get overcharged or over discharged if you get one with the BMS in it. Um, if you wanna go build your own, it's a great project. There's a lot of, there are a lot of resources online. Um, uh, I've got a bunch of links at the end of the presentation. We can send that out afterwards. Um, it's just good fun, right? So that's kind of the talk. And I'm stick around as long as you guys like for questions, uh, unless you have other club business. Uh, my presentations are already on my QRZ. So you can go to my QRZ, um, AI6MS. Uh, you can shoot me an email if you have questions. Uh, I've got my other talks there listed too. I'm always happy to give those to groups. Um, and yeah, I'll stick around for any other questions. Thanks for having me. Fair question, Marcel. Uh, yeah. For lithium polymer batteries, 
RC model flying. You uh, recommend uh, balanced charging every time or just uh, uh, and storage uh, voltage? Yeah, so lithium polymer uh, is, I didn't go into depth in that chemistry. So lithium polymer is typically 3.7 volts nominal. Um, and when you're buying an RC pack, the packs often don't have a BMS on them. Um, so they just have bare cells that are stacked together and then they have what's known as a balance lead, which is the individual voltage taps coming out of the side of the battery. Um, and when you charge those, you always need to use a, a, a balanced charger um, because there's no battery management system in there. So if you just charge them with a raw voltage across the ends, nothing is monitoring the individual cells voltages. So if they go thermal runaway, they go, there's nothing monitoring, there's nothing keeping an eye on them. So you use a balance charger and a balance charger, when you hook up the balance leads, then it's monitoring individual cell voltages to make sure as you're charging it, all of those individual cells are still within range and within safe ranges. So yeah, if you're buying one of those packs that doesn't have a built-in battery management system, you absolutely need to include that. Um, so keep that in mind. Yeah. Other questions? I might have missed it early, but uh, uh, missed the first few minutes. But what is your back? Sorry, you, someone just muted you halfway through. You want to? What What is the question? Paul, are you still there? He is. He's finding the mute button. Yeah. There he goes. All right. Yeah. I was. Well, what's going on? Uh, I might, you might have said, or I missed the first five minutes or so, but what is the background there? The, the, the peak behind you with all the antennas? Is oh, the peak behind me. Uh, good question. Uh, that's Loma Prieta Peak in South San Jose in California. Um, and that has, uh, this is the wind system radio on this one and the Loma Pioneer Radio Club. This is the state of California tower. This picture is taken from the AT&T long line tower and it's a bunch of other FM radios and stuff. That's Silicon Valley in the background. Um, so, yeah. Good question. <laughs> Marcel, can you fl flip back one slide? Yeah. The table? Yeah. Um, back to the protections needed for the um, Life Pro. Uh, yeah. When you buy the, the, the little smaller ones from Bayano, does it, it comes with the protection? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so the protections needed, so this, this comparison table is for the chemistry, right? Lithium, lithium chemistry is needing lots of protection. But when you buy, yeah, like an assembled pack from Bioeno, they come with all those protections on them. So if you buy a pack from Bioeno, that column changes significantly. Your protections needed goes to none because they're all included. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Um, I've got a few. Um, Go ahead. By the way, if, with this slide up on the screen, if anybody wants a copy of it, just take a screenshot. You know. Uh, you can you, got the, the slides available on his QRZ. You can get them there. But if you yeah, want you can get the whole fly deck here. So yeah, so you can get it there too. I mean, it's either way. Um, so is the is the is that is the the uh, lipo is that the reason why like a car charging unit, you know, I got a, a jump start unit, why they're so small now is because that's the chemistry they're using. Yeah, so so car chargers like yeah, the old the older ones they looked like big lunch boxes and they were super heavy. Those were bled, right? They were they had a little uh, similar to the battery that was shown earlier. Um, they have usually a ten or a seventeen amp hour lead acid battery sitting in there, and they're terrible because there's tons of internal voltage drop and they always discharge and they're never charged when you need them. The newer little jump starters like the Noco ones or um, oh, I forgot the brand of the Aki is the one I've got. Um, uh, Project Farm has a pretty good video on it on YouTube on different jump starters. Um, yeah, those are all using lithium chemistries in them. Um, typically lithium ion or polymer, kind of hard to tell externally which one they're using unless you do some voltage measurements or open it up and look at the cell itself. Um, and yeah, those are rated for very short but very high discharge events. So some of those can push 100 plus amps um, briefly, right? They can't do that sustained, they'll overheat. Um, but they also have protections built in. So a lot of those packs will have a little like external plug unit with the two jumper leads on it. That plug unit has a shunt in it and some other protection to keep an eye on the pack. And if it pulls too much current for too long, it'll disconnect so that it doesn't damage the pack. Um, and often they'll have a little bit of thermal protection built in if it's a decent brand, right? If it's a super cheapo, the cheapest one you found online, um, your mileage may vary. And I might not leave that one in my car all the time. 
So especially if it's a hot desert environment and I wouldn't leave it fully charged. So uh, yeah, I get a little bit <laughs> to the question of shipping batteries earlier. Uh, yeah, I don't leave a lot of batteries in my car, especially if it's hot. Uh, so. <laughs> I've got a Duracell unit and it's got the, the, the Bluetooth, you know, connectivity for, for, yep. um, yeah, I was, I was surprised to see them when I went looking for one shopping for one last time, how small they'd gotten. Yeah. Just, they're, they're impressive. I've got, I don't have it here, but it's in my car as well. It's literally like a subway sandwich size battery pack and I can jump cars five times with it or something, or even more for smaller engines. Um, it's come in super handy because I used to always carry jumping cables. Well, I still carry jumping cables in the car. Um, but if I come across a car that's on the side of the road that needs a jump or is in the parking lot, and I've done that two or three times already just in the past year, um, I can just come out with my little box and literally plug it in, press a button and say, start your engine. And it just boop, starts right up. So I'd strongly recommend it. They're less than a hundred bucks for a decent one. So uh, totally worth it. What are the uh, EV car manufacturers using for uh, protection? What are the EV car uh, manufacturers using? Uh, lots of protection. So uh, like high level, same concept. They've got cells. The cells are built into packs and each of those packs has a BMS on it. Um, for if you think about larger cell manufacturers like Nissan Leaf and, and Tesla um, you know, cars, they have modules and each of those modules has protections built into it typically. Um, or at a very minimum, it's kind of like the RC pack where it has balance leads and thermistor leads coming out of it and then plug into a larger pack management system. So when you start looking at these really big battery packs that are tons of smaller modules, like one of the Tesla modules is like huge, right? There are a bunch of videos online of people doing teardowns. Um, those have uh, thermal management in them. So they actually have like glycol cooling lines running through them to actually cool the packs when they're doing rapid charging and stuff. Um, running it through a radiator and actually cooling down the battery packs so that they can fast charge them. Um, they have yeah individual cell voltage taps for sure and uh, temperature monitoring for sure in all of those packs to keep an eye on them. Um, and then that's going back to either a local BMS and or a central pack management system that is then looking at all of those individual modules and making sure the pack as a whole is happy. Um, sometimes they can turn off one pack, they can turn off a module, they can reroute current from modules to each other. Um, there's some pretty advanced circuitry starting to go into those. Um, and yeah, especially as packs get bigger and packs are starting to become reused, like my friend bought a used Nissan Leaf that had six miles of range on it or something. So it's a little bit tricky to get home. But um, once he got it home, he then replaced the battery pack in it and bought a rebuilt battery pack. Because typically when one of these large packs dies, it's just one of the modules that's failed short and it's protected itself where it says, hey, I'm no longer available. Um, so you can literally take that pack apart, replace the one module, and now your car has 45 miles range again or 60 miles range or something. So um, that's pretty common as well that you can do that. And with more advanced packs, you can actually monitor them individually. People with, um, yeah, Nissan Leafs and other cars, they can put in their own battery management system. There's some open source ones from like Batrium and stuff that you can actually look at the individual module voltages in your car screen, infotainment screen. It's pretty cool. So uh, a lot of neat hacking out there these days. You you mentioned uh, <clears throat> the fact that there are counterfeits and cheap knockoffs uh, out on the uh, on the internet, especially in sites like eBay. Uh, how do you do? You have any tips for how to protect yourself or how to try to be uh, uh, assured that you're getting something uh, real? <laughs> yeah, it's it's a difficult question, honestly. In the last like definitely in the last six months and year, like as people have been remote and home more, it's gotten worse, it feels like. At least I'm seeing more of it. Maybe that's because people have more time to write in forums and make YouTube videos and, and comment on it. Um, a, a couple things there. So one is buy from reputable manufacturers. So if you're, if you're not building your own packs, like if you're going to buy ONO, they have their own supply chain. They're working with their vendors all the way up to the cell level. They're, they're I likely that their company is working down, uh, even further upstream to make sure that they're using no conflict minerals and that sort of stuff as well. Um, like at large companies like where I work and other places, they're doing that up their whole supply chain. So they're making sure that they're good, high quality parts that they're using all the way down. Um, and any of the reputable manufacturers will do that. Um, if you're building your own packs and you're buying cells, um, there are kind of two ways. One is you can get used cells. And if you're getting used cells again from reputable sources, so if you're taking apart used DeWalt battery packs 
you're going to get good quality batteries because DeWalt, when they're buying their cells, has a quality department that's making sure that those cells are coming from good sources, right? Um, if you're taking apart used e-bike battery packs from no name, who knows what branded components from some e-bike that you got off of eBay, um, I wouldn't necessarily trust those cells to be high quality. Now, does that mean I won't use them? No, it just means that I'll be even more careful when I'm using them. I'll test them individually. I will build a pack where every cell is individually fused. I'll reduce the risk by building a higher safety, a higher margin for safety in the pack that I'm building um, if I'm getting those cells. Um, the other thing, so individually testing is a big one. Um, and I actually have friends that regularly do this. They buy, you know, when they see a great deal on AliExpress or Alibaba or some other, you know, eBay or other websites and find, hey, this 200 amp, 80 amp hour lithium iron phosphate cell looks like a great deal. Let me buy it. And the first thing they do is capacity test it. And if the capacity test comes back below what they sold it as, they go push for a refund and they get a partial refund, right? Um, they'll still use it. It's still a perfectly fine battery. It might've been cycled more and that's why it's lower capacity. It might've been B grade and it came off the supply chain as, hey, these were originally designed as 280 amp hour batteries, but they're really only getting 260. Great, you should sell them as B grade cells at 260 and get a discount. And people happily buy those and you can use them just fine and dandy. Um, but it's, you, you know, make sure you know what you're getting. Uh, one of the presentations I link or one of the YouTube channels, uh, Will Prouse, he actually does a very good job. He's based out in um, Nevada and is very honest and open with his reviews and buys a lot of these cells online. If you're looking at building like a big battery backup for your shack or for um, uh, for your shack or for uh, like a, an RV or a, or a trailer or a solar trailer or something, um, he buys a lot of these batteries like that and will test them and, and keeps a list on his website uh, under this yeah, design your own lithium iron phosphate system. Um, that's a really good link. He has good cells link there that I trust. Um, and he, he updates that regularly. So if he finds out that one of the manufacturers that he's recommending is now suddenly stocking cells that are questionable, he'll contact them and take it down from his website for the time being and notify his followers and say, hey, I found an issue with some of these cells, like some of them, they found some leaking electrolyte from one of the vendors. They're dealing with it. They addressed it. They fixed it. They put out the new version and they're very open and transparent about it. So that's been really good. Um, so I hope that answered your question. Yes. Other uh, questions? Oops. Um, yeah, I've got a question. If you have to, the, uh, the danger of uh, shipping again or where that comes yeah. in, if you're worried about, or if they're worried about something happening to the box, you know, on the on the plane or while they're shipping it, wouldn't that same um, concern be there if I'm same, you know, micro center and I've got a, a pile of laptops, you know, in the warehouse and I'm grabbing laptops and, I mean, it seems like it's the same thing, the same exposure would be there. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I laugh. I shouldn't laugh. It's terrible, but. Uh, if you read some articles around e-waste recycling plants, there have been a number of e-waste recycling plants that have burned to the ground in the last couple of years for exactly that reason, no. because people recycled laptops and left the batteries in them and they went into the shredder and then the shredder caught fire, right? Um, that happens a lot, right? Uh, uh, my work, we have very dedicated, very specific dedicated work streams for battery disposal. Um, and that's for batteries that are not damaged, right? So just a cell that is, you know, in good condition, but just no longer needed at the company. We make sure we put it into, you know, a battery disposal bin, and then those get emptied daily, like nightly, those get emptied by the security staff and get brought into fireproof cabinets in a room in a separate building, right? Until then, I think monthly or whatever, they come and pick up from the hazmat crew that comes and picks them up. And that's non-damaged cells. Now, if the cells are damaged because you were taking apart a device and there was the damaged cell, there's a whole separate procedure for that because those fall into a whole nother hazard category. And obviously, if they're, if it's a punctured cell or if it's in an un unstable state, there are mitigations you can do to get it to a safer state where you can then get it to a recycler or dispose of it safely. Um, so yeah, if uh, my, my recent examples, I just moved houses and uh, I packed anything that had a lithium battery, went into separate boxes that were labeled, do not put these on the moving truck. These are only for the car. And like you pack them near a door in the car and you only stay with them when they're in the car, right? And these were like, like HTs, like literally my box with HTs did not go in the truck. Um, I've seen a U-Haul truck that was completely burned to the ground, to the chassis, like the whole frame is just one big mild, melted pile of people's belongings. 
Um, and those are usually triggered by that sort of thing. Something, not necessarily a lithium battery always, but something inside there that went boom and caught fire, right? So I had several boxes, a lot of boxes of things with batteries in them that stayed in the car. And then they were with us in the car. And if anything did happen, you open up the side door of the car and dump them on the side of the road because you would smell it and hear it right be before something happened. Or you could at least not blow up all your belongings in the truck. So yes, those are the little things we can do as hams. Now that goes back to my earlier point is like my bioeno pack I have sitting in this hard Pelican case, right? And like this case, I'm happy to throw in the back of a pickup truck and have it bouncing around with repeater boxes and toolboxes and whatever else. The pack that's inside there, I wouldn't do that with, right? I would have in a backpack if I'm walking carefully with it. And if I fell while I was hiking up a mountain and the battery was in the backpack, I would dump the backpack quickly and then check it carefully and make sure the battery didn't get dinged or damaged when I fell. Um, so yeah, take precautions. Just like when you're working with generators and you have cans of fuel laying around, you're careful with those as well. So um, yeah, like I said, treat it like a Marcel, grenade. <laughs> yeah. For um, um, for RVs, you know, a lot of people are putting uh, lithium batteries in their um, RVs, um, but there's a problem charging it from the alternators in the car. And you usually have to go through a battery to battery charger. What What's going on there? Why is that? Yeah, so in RVs and trailers and other places where you have multiple batteries in a system, um, you'll want to have some sort of battery isolation effectively between the batteries. So the mental model here is like if you have an RV, you have your main battery, which is the starter battery for the car or for the engine. And then you have your auxiliary battery. That's the one that powers your lights in the RV, your whatever, your air conditioning, your, your TV, et cetera, right? Um, when you're plug you're when you're running when you're sitting at a campsite and you're not running the engine and you're not plugged into shore power you never are allowed to use your starter battery because you never want to drain your starter battery you want to make sure that that's always available to start your engine and drive the rv but you're now draining the battery that's inside the rv right so as you're running overnight if you're running the ac if you're running the batteries whatever that battery now went from whatever down to i don't know 10 volts half 50 percent capacity whatever um if you now reconnect it immediately when you start the engine to that 14.2 volt alternator charging battery, you created a short between a lower voltage battery and a higher voltage battery, and you're now dumping 100 amps from your alternator into that RV battery. That's bad, right? So you need to have what's known as like, uh, what Westmount Radio makes something called an ISO power, is that power works? I forget, one of them. They make an ISO power, which is an isolation power unit for exactly that. They also build it for like fire trucks and, and other um, EMS units where it effectively detects when the alternator turns on and then it enables a charge current. So it'll limit it to 10 amps or 20 amps or whatever you set for the size of the battery to make sure that you don't charge that battery too quickly and that you don't overload your alternator. You don't wanna pull hundred amps from the alternator continuously. That's a bad idea because it'll burn out really quick. And it's designed to start, you know, charge your battery but not run that continuously. Um, so that's generally, that's the short version of kind of, you wanna make sure that separate batteries, especially if they're being run independently, need to be carefully connected back together so that you don't cause high current events. I think that's kind of the summary, mm -hmm. if that answers your question. I have a quick question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, what am I going to do with all my NICAD batteries? <laughs> Recycle them. <laughs> Are they obsolete now? Uh, no, they're not obsolete. I mean, I still have a handful. I have a lot of uh, little Eneloop batteries. You, you've probably seen the little, uh, the NIM batteries. Uh, they're AA, AAA replacements. I use those in TV remotes and flashlights and anything that isn't 18650. Like I've got a lot of things that are 18650 in my life now. Flashlights, headlamps, um, fans, chargers, you name it, battery banks. Um, and I have a surplus of 18650s. But yeah, so NIM batteries, I still have a lot of AA's and AAA's. NICAD's Honestly, I don't think I have any in my life anymore. Um, my DeWalt battery pack, I replaced <laughs> it with a lithium one, um, sold the old one, someone else used it. You could replace it. You could build your own um, lithium pack for, for it. They make replacement packs that are lithium as well for NICAD systems. Um, NICAD batteries also have a shelf life. So you can do some, like I've had some old HTs, like I have some old Motorola HTs that were NICAD based and we had to go through and do uh, pulse conditioning on the cells. So you actually run it on a special charger that sends little voltage spikes to it and tries to, you know, get rid of some degradation in the cell and make it have higher capacity and last a little bit longer. 
but they're all pretty much end of life at that point anyway. So you're just kind of inkling maybe a couple more years out of it um, if you're using it regularly. So, I mean, kind of depends if you have it. Um, <laughs> uh, the other one I would call out is NICAD. Flooded NICADs are a thing. So this is fascinating. My, uh, the Amateur Radio Club at my university, we actually had a flooded NICAD battery. Um, that thing lasts forever. It's a tank. Came out of a hospital system for a battery backup holdover before the generator kicks in. Um, and it was a flooded system, highly like cadmium in there and like all sorts of nasty chemicals. But the battery itself was rock solid. You couldn't kill that thing. It was great. Um, and we used that for a number, number of years until the capacity degraded to the point where it wasn't really useful and we've replaced it now. Um, but yeah, if you have that sort of battery, definitely hold on to it because you can get 10, 15, 20 years out of it still um, if you maintain it and keep the electrolyte loaded. But I'm assuming you're talking about smaller cells. So <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Do you have any recommendations for safe disposal of batteries? Yeah, your local, uh, talk to your local has, hazardous waste or just your local waste department. So uh, for a household hazardous waste, most jurisdictions like your normal trash company has a process for it um, if it's personal use. Now this is something where especially hobbyists and hobbyists that are battery enthusiasts run into problems. Um, I have a friend of mine who can no longer bring lithium batteries to his local dump because they think it's commercial because he builds so many batteries at home, but it's literally they're just building power walls, right? So for household hazardous waste, which is a category that like people can usually bring limited quantities to places and they'll have rules about how much you can bring, how to transport it as well, like no more than a five gallon bucket worth of e-waste per trip per month or per residence or something like that. Um, uh, the general rule of thumb is have it be discharged first. So lithium batteries really are, and I put a little asterisk on this, but they're really only hazardous at higher voltages. So like above 90% state of charge is when they start getting like more dangerous and unstable. If you discharge that battery down to zero volts or three volts or whatever the cutoff is, it's you really can't cause it to go boom, right? You have to like literally put it in the fire and wait for the like hard shell to explode just from thermal expansion, right? Um, yeah, Bob mentioned too, Home Depot and Best Buy take batteries. So any place that sells battery, I'm not sure about how it works in Georgia. In California, uh, there are all sorts of laws about uh, places that sell batteries have to receive them as well. So you always can bring back things that were sold from that place. Um, and uh, similar things should be in, in your area as well, I'm guessing. Um, Dave has a comment. Yeah, yeah we have a, a store, Batteries Plus, and uh, that sells all different types of batteries, including preformed packs. They accept batteries. So I've taken NICADs, uh, AGMs. I've taken the whole slew of batteries there. And they willingly take them. Of course, they want to sell you a replacement, but you're just yep. like, nope, don't need it. Thank you. And um, yeah, and I found that some recycle places will actually pay you money for batteries. Yeah. So. So two things, one on the Batteries Plus, they're a great little shop. I love them. We have them here in California too. Um, generally very knowledgeable people in those stores. So if you have battery questions or you're looking for a weird battery, you have some weird device, they are really good. And they'll even build custom batteries for you, which is pretty neat um, and, and work with you on stuff. They also sell battery tenders and all sorts of other stuff. Um, on the recycling point, um, absolutely. So I saw some number... I think it's like $2 a kilogram or something for like uh, lead acids. Lead acids are something like 99% recyclable. They literally take the whole lead acid battery, drop it in a shredder. There's a great video on YouTube. I'd have to dig it out, um, but look for like lithium or lead acid battery recycling. They literally take the battery, dump the whole thing in a shredder, and then the lead goes to the bottom, the plastic floats to the top, the electrolyte they neutralize, uh, the plastics they all go put into plastic recycling, the lead they take out, they turn into lead ingots. Um, the acid, they can neutralize, filter it, and put out cleaner water than the city water gives you. Um, but 99% of the materials can get recycled. So uh, when they, like, when you get a battery from a store, they often charge you like 10 bucks, like core charge is what they call it or something like that, or battery charge. When you bring the replacement battery back, they give you that refund because they're effectively making that money on the recycling, right? So those like lead acid batteries have quite a good resale value. Um, lithium is not there yet. So it generally costs more money to get rid of e-waste than you can make from it. Um, it is starting to change. There are startups like Redwood Energy or sorry, Redwood Materials, I think they're in, in, uh, in Nevada as well. Uh, and a number of other startups and a ton of research into how do we recycle lithium batteries better. Um, they can recover like in lab environments, they've been able to recover up to, I think, like 70% of the materials. 
most like larger scale operations are not able to recover that much, like 30 or 40%. The rest is still trash. Um, so there's, and these numbers are changing all the time, so don't quote me on that. Um, but the, that's kind of the direction it's going to be going. We know that there's a huge supply and demand for batteries right now, for lithium batteries specifically with electric vehicles. Ex like, again, I don't use the word exploding, Marcel, in battery presentation, right? <laughs> lithium batteries is booming in popularity, right? Um, uh, that's probably not also the best choice of words, but uh, the, the, the recycling is a huge issue, right? The early EVs that were coming out from the, you know, more than 10 years ago now from this Leafs from the first generations, those batteries need a home, right? So uh, second life um, batteries and like uh, energy storage systems for batteries, that's all figuring out how to make that work out and, and what we can do with them. Like when an electric vehicle is done with a battery, it doesn't mean it's dead. It just means it's maybe at 70% of its remaining capacity. Maybe it can't provide that zero to 60 in three seconds anymore, but it could be used for a battery backup system or provide grid store, grid tie energy. Um, and that's a really big market right now. So thinking in the future and talking about sustainability aspects, something I'm really passionate about too, um, companies like Rivian, who's building the electric pickup truck, they're designing their battery packs from day one that once the user is no longer done with it, um, they can, or when the user wants to upgrade their battery and like get the performance back, they can buy the battery upgrade. The old battery can get dropped directly into a grid storage application and start feeding the battery, like the grid storage for, um, you know, go for a town that's completely off grid and just be solar powered with old electric vehicles providing the energy at, at night. So that's super cool, right? Um, and that's definitely the future. Are we going to run out of lithium? Uh, mixed articles on that from what I've seen, mixed research. Uh, they keep finding more. And that's, I think, you know, for now, no. Um, but that's also a reason why recycling is something that is being looked at heavily. Um, how much lithium can we recover from cells? Because if we build tons of cells and it's a non renewable resource, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot because you're you know doing renewable energy with non-renewable resources um so there's a trade-off there um and i think that's where the the second life and like the reuse and the extending the life of of existing materials you've built is always better like retrofitting an existing building is always better than tearing it down and starting from scratch it's not necessarily cheaper but it's definitely more uh, better for the environment because your your carbon footprint's lower um so similar thing in the battery space is yeah we try to find ways to not have to use raw materials from the earth that are not replaceable. Um, and yeah, I honestly don't know a ton about the like raw materials in the world and how much lithium exists, but I know they keep finding more now that they're looking for it because there's such a high demand for batteries. There's a big shortage of batteries, honestly. Um, it's hard for manufacturers to buy like 18650 cells because the electric vehicle markets are just gobbling them up. Right, the big name companies are just buying them with massive orders and saying, "We'll take all of your supply from this factory. Don't sell to anyone else. Just sell them to us, and we'll pay for them now, and not and wait for them two years from now." Right, so it's pretty crazy. Thank you for a great presentation. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for all the great questions. They're re really good, engaged groups. So I really <laughs> appreciate that. It's always <laughs> fun to talk about this stuff. And that, yeah. yes, it was an excellent presentation. That was very, very good. Very Thanks. informative. I always try to keep it relevant for the group. I, it's it's generally the ham focus, I think, keeps it interesting for the hobby that we're all in. But there's there are obviously huge applications from this. For amateur radio lithium iron phosphate is an obvious solution. But the battery space overall is absolutely fascinating. Um, and it's always interesting to see how we um, figure that out. So yeah, definitely. I want to thank you for I don't I should tell everybody that I was having trouble finding a program and we had been working with Marcel on, on which month it was going to be, you know, in the summer or in the fall. And I sent him a note on Monday saying, we've got some openings in the fall, but by the way, we've got an opening on Thursday. And I was totally expecting him to say what everybody else said, which was, you know, thanks, but no thanks. Um, so and I think I told him, I said, this, this has helped my blood pressure, my, my heart doctor. <laughs> thanks you. And I, I appreciate your being so flexible on this and doing a great presentation. I was, I wrote down something the other day of things I wanted to know about batteries, um, and you, you got you hit it all. Well, thanks. No, it's it's, it's great. I was, I was glad it worked out. It's always sometimes last minute works out better, right? Because you don't know what your schedule looks like in advance, and and it's worked out great. So I'm glad I was able to fill the slot for you guys and lower your blood pressure. Yeah. You can have your doctor send me a check later.
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got your email. I got your email. You'll be sorry. <laughs> yeah, he'll pay you off in batteries. <laughs> oh, please send them my yeah. way. I'll happily receive them. Yeah. I'll put the sticker. Unfortunately, on. the batteries I want will have to be ground shipped from from Georgia. So, yeah, I'll make it work. <laughs> it's dark here now. John, yeah. we can, are we good? Yeah, real quick, if everybody runs off, uh, we got a HRO gift certificate to give away. Um, thanks, Marcel. That was a was a great presentation, and uh, thanks for all the way from Florida. Thanks for Bell and our friend out there. He's he's been doing a very good job putting together programs, but you always run into a stumble here and there trying to fill a spot and we couldn't have asked for a better presentation. So thank you for that. Um, while I'm digging through the bucket, I've been putting everybody's name in the bucket here and let uh, Rob real quick, tell us what's on tap for uh, June's program. You gotta unmute. You gotta unmute there. Gotta unmute. Good, cause I stumbled. I the June program is going to be John Clute, who used to live here. He's an AMSAT satellite guy. Yeah. Uh, he used to be at the uh, our ham fest, and he would bring a satellite trailer, you know, trailer out front with with antennas on it, and do contacts from there. He moved out west, but he's going to give us a presentation on the space station or the or, and or the uh, the ham radio use in the space station. In fact, they got a new ham radio uh, set up on there and or talking about satellites. And he said, you know, what do you, what, what do you want to know about space satellites, space station? You know, what do you, so let me know, send, send a note, put a, put a note on the ARC um, on groups.io saying, you know, this is the, the, this is the part of satellites I want to find out about, or I want to know all about. Are we, anything else? Are we level? There are some problem areas, let's look at that. Yeah. <laughs> And look how much is falling. Wow. Somebody needs to mute. All right. Uh, let's see. For tonight's prize, we have uh, Diane K, uh, KY4BN. Do I have that right? Oh, there she is. Yeah. Okay. Good. She's still with us. It's a $25 yeah. gift ticket for HRO. And I'll, uh, I'll let you know tomorrow when that's in the system down there so that it, it's an in store type thing. So you have to kind of buy some. I think you can buy it online from the house directly from the store and use it. Uh, but you can always check with them uh, when you're ready and they can do, kind of give you, it's not an online where you can use it on their main catalog. So you'll have to deal with the uh, Atlanta HRO for that. So congratulations, uh, Di cool. Diane. And thank thank you. you all for uh, being with us tonight. We've uh, had a full night. Uh, Stephen updated us uh, about the repeater. Real quick for this weekend, for those of you that uh, might be interested, there's a fox hunt with a little bit of a twist uh, down in Fayette County. Uh, instead of an event where you run down there all at the same time, they're going to be running it both Saturday and Sunday from 7 to 7. Uh, you can go to their website at uh, kk4gq.org, I believe, and there's some inf uh, information on exactly how to do that uh, under their news section. I think uh, there's something about the, using the DTM and, uh, D, I'm sorry, DTMF to, to uh, activate the Fox or something. So uh, check uh, check their website for the details. And like I said, that's from seven to seven, both Saturday and Sunday. Basically the winner is gonna be picked from those of you that go to the Fox and drop either your QSL or business card in their box. Once you found the Fox, they'll draw a prize winner from that box. So it's a little different. You don't have to necessarily be the fastest this time. So that'll be a little fun. So please do uh, check that out at the Fayette County Amateur Radio Club. And of course, uh, we had a great uh, Georgia QSO party. We had quite a few people that showed up to Brook Run Park. Uh, we did one of our days in the park. Bill Perkins uh, set it up for us. And we had a lot of fun uh, working the Georgia QSO party. So thanks to Bill on that. Uh, and no ham fest this year again because of uh, the uh, Jim Miller Park and Cobb County in general is, is uh, covered up with uh, COVID, uh, COVID uh, testing and vaccinations. And they couldn't uh, commit to anything until late May that uh, that was going to be the earliest I was even going to hear if we could use the facility. So we had to kind of release our vendors. And um, we kind of knew this in uh, going into April, early April, but we kind of held out as long as we could. So no ham fest this year, but we'll be back on the first Saturday of 2022 and uh, put that on your calendar. I know it's a little far off, but uh, never hurts to put it on your calendar. So, uh, and then of course the radio. 
in 2022. Yeah, and then it's June uh, 4th, 2022, that's right. And then of course, uh, keep checking the website for information on field day. We'll have another in-person type uh, outing for uh, field day this year. So uh, please do check the website for that. And of course, uh, for those that are club members, we're always looking for people, people that uh, have an interest in helping the club. So if you have an interest in being on the repeater committee or helping with activities or something like that, please contact one of us and let us know so that we can uh, get you rolling with uh, club activities. And we're always grateful when people step in and help. So once again tonight, thanks to uh, Rob for such another wonderful, uh, set up another wonderful presentation for us. And uh, please do join us uh, next month, always the first Thursday of the month. So um, thanks again and uh, congratulations to Diane on the gift certificate. And uh, any other questions that anybody has for anything club wise or Marcel last minute thinkings or anything? Unseen, okay. Well, thanks for joining us again tonight and uh, we look forward to uh, seeing y'all again uh, next month. Y'all have a good evening. 73. Thanks, have a good night. Thanks for having me. Good evening. Oh, sorry.